Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Gideon, and I work at, um, can you have the presentation showed, please? Thank you. So I work, I'm the chief marketing and customer experience um, uh, executive at a company called Decodia. We're an Israeli-based startup, um, and we have uh, a very unique technology which I would like to uh, share with you. and. In fact, the first application of this technology is in chess. And uh, I'll go through the technology first, and in the end, we'll touch upon what it is that we do in chess. Um, because there are a few facets uh, to this. So just a quick look. I'm not the technical guy. I'm not the brains behind the system. Uh, the brain who invented some of the innovative algorithms that we have uh, are all based in Israel. And um, the co-founder who has a PhD in philosophy and mathematics and physics is Ofer. Um, so I'm basically speaking on his behalf. And later on, if you have any questions that might be a bit too technical, then I'm glad to connect you uh, with him. So what is it that Decodia does as a company? We're a startup company. We're a pre-funded company looking for investment right now. Um, and what we do is we try to mimic high cognitive functions. So what does that mean? Um, we work in domains where there are complex decision-making processes, and I'll show some examples very soon. Um, and what we try to do is to model how a human expert would explain or uh, infer information from a situation which was delivered by an AI system. And what we do is we identify high-level concepts. Uh, for example, a high-level concept would be uh, a deduction chain or uh, a counterfactual, if you will. I'll explain these concepts uh, in a moment. Um, and what we do, just as a diagram, um, imagine today an AI system. It could be a chess engine. It could be any AI system that is used today in the industry in any domain. Um, so there is a situation, you can see on the left, and the AI system takes that situation and recommends what to do when that situation occurs. So that could be a chess position, but it could be lots of other things. It could be a credit score for taking a loan at the bank. It could be a biomed algorithm that helps doctors decide what is the best medicine to serve at this specific situation. And what we do is we basically have a wrap around this recommendation system. We plug in our own uh, layer of a logic, called a logic layer, and a domain-specific concepts database, which means that it needs to understand the field in which the system operates to some extent. And uh, it then pulls out a human explanation of why was this specific AI recommendation produced. And with that, what we're trying to do is basically answer one of the hottest topics today in artificial intelligence, which is explainable AI, making AI more transparent. And just a quick uh, look to the past. People uh, before me here already mentioned how AI and chess have already been kind of, um, yeah, entangled in a way. Uh, and back in the days, whether it was Turing or von Neumann or um, Shannon, those people already saw chess as a feat, a human feat. And um, although today's uh, AI and uh, the focus of AI is slightly different than what it used to be in the past, and you can see it here, if you don't mind to expand uh, the diagram so I can show you, this is a very quick evolution of AI um, where it started from handcrafted knowledge, moved on to statistical learning, which is machine learning, and neural networks, and now we're entering into a phase called contextual adaptation, if you will, where we want to make more sense out of what those statistical models are able to give us. An example of uh, this, this shift is given with this example, which was taken from a DARPA um, lecture. DARPA is a serious uh, defense uh, body in the States, which has a 
a huge project invested into explainable AI. Um, and uh, the director of that uh, agency gave the example of how machine learning algorithms today are able to um, basically execute low cognitive functions. Low cognitive functions, not in a derogatory manner, but low cognitive in the sense that it's things like seeing, hearing, speaking, not necessarily thinking. Um, and in the sense of this, you can see algorithm, algorithms today can already be um, coded to decipher what is in a picture. And in this case, it's saying, okay, so here is a cat. But what uh, the next phase or generation of AI is trying to do is to say, how do you know that this is a cat? And if we lend this inf information or this example to other areas, I take you back to the example of a credit score. If someone is given a no at the bank, no, you cannot have a loan right now, that person would like to know why he's given the no. Today, they cannot tell because they're based on a black box AI system. So, chess, as you saw through the development in the past, has kind of shifted away and other uh, very exciting and helpful technologies have come into aid. Um, but it looks like, indeed, DeepMind, as Matthew and Natasha already mentioned, has kind of put chess back on the horse. Um, and I'm quoting uh, Gary Kasparov, who said, chess has been used as a Rosetta Stone of both human machine cognition for over a century, and AlphaZero renews the remarkable connection between an ancient board game and cutting edge, edge science. And this basically encapsulates a bit of what our company does and the vision for what we're trying to do. Um, so we see chess as a perfect playground for AI research. But the research that we're interested in, again, relates to those high cognitive functions. Or in other words, how do humans think? So we're trying to shift the lens to a slightly different uh, perspective. Just imagine what are the cognitive tools that are required to play chess? And how do they compare to the cognitive tools, for example, that are required to come up with um, a mathematical proof? Okay? We could take simple examples like what is an even number? Um, so an even number has certain rules and we can always draw back from an example of what an even number is back to the proof. But can we do that in chess? Can we actually take a rule in chess or a rule of thumb or maybe something that people tell you that's a good thing to do or that's a bad thing to do in chess? Let's say a double, doubled pawns, okay? So when are doubled pawns are good things and when are they bad things? It really depends on the position. In that sense, it just shows how thinking in chess and being able to mimic how people think in chess gives us a window to understand how people think in general. And that's the focus of what we do. So, what is it that we're trying to do? We're taking two agents. One agent is the machine, the other agent is the human. And we say, what are the merits that each of those agents have? We know that computers are very good at calculations. We know that humans are very good at um, conceptualizing, abstracting, and focusing on key data points. So while a computer would need hundreds of millions of positions to make a decision, a human would only need a few tens of them. And those two uh, merits of each agent are not interchangeable. So a computer cannot do what a human does, a human cannot do what a computer does, but how do we help those two agents communicate? That's the core of our technology. So we create a hybrid of a say, machine, half machine, half human uh, expert. And that expert, what it is able to do is uh, we harness the achievements of current AI systems. Um, in the example of chess, we will be talking about the magnificent Stockfish engine, uh, which is ba basing uh, our kind of AI system from which we retrieve some of the uh, recommendations. And we try to put um, the capabilities and the thought processes of a human within that situation. Meaning, had a human been able to look back and forth in a decision tree of chess, 300 millions positions, what 
would it have said had it had the powers to speak? That's basically what we're doing. Um, and we, uh, for those who are more uh, technically savvy, we don't extract information from the algorithm. For example, features, which is what we saw in the cats example, uh, we do something else. And similar to AlphaZero, uh, which solves general problems of games, so as you saw, you can apply AlphaZero on chess, on Shogi, on Go, um, so in a way it's agnostic to the playing environment that it resides in. Similarly, we can take our algorithms and kind of wrap them as a layer around different AI recommendation systems. So this is all a bit uh, technical, uh, but now I want to give you examples of those specialties that we have developed and to see them in action through our um, debut product, which is DecoChess. So one of the things we're able to do is to examine the applications of an action on future actions down the road. And when I say down the road, literally I mean down the decision tree. So if chess is described as a decision tree, um, we can say, now I've made this action, what will that do a couple of moves ahead? That's one uh, big thing that we're able to do. And the other is to identify the implications that we as humans reflect on. And you will see this uh, live in just a moment. And I'll touch upon the last example in one second. So I'm taking you to the uh, DecoChess website. As I said, this is our debut product. Um, so what we do is we auto-explain chess moves and positions. And um, apart from the general um, goals that we set to ourselves as mimicking human reasoning, uh, we have a passion for chess and we have a vision to make chess more explainable. And as you probably know, um, the majority of chess players today out there in the world, especially when they play online, they use an engine. Whether they're professionals um, and mainly amateurs, they finish a game, they want to have a look and see what were their mistakes, um, and what they do as they turn to the engine. And engines are great. Engines uh, have helped professional chess grow, they've helped the non-professional chess grow, but we feel like engines are lacking that exactly uh, same uh, concept of explainability. So they're leaving the chess community with an answer sheet, but they do not leave them with the why. So um, what I'm gonna do is just show you some examples from our system of what we're able to do and how we're able to help players in chess, but also you can see through those examples what can this algorithm do later on if it's applied to a different AI system. Maybe and yeah, so let's just open another one. Another tab. Yeah. Excellent, okay, good. Just one moment. Okay, so we'll start with uh, the first example, what I told you about how uh, an action in the present uh, affects actions later down the decision tree or down the road. So this is the game I told you about. This is uh, Kramnik versus Liko. Um, and if we just expand the board a little bit. It's actually not working. Okay, here we go. Now it's working. Okay, so you can all see the board. Um, this is White's move. White, um, by the engine, is recommended to play Queen to A1. And what you can see on the right is basically the Deco Chess software, uh, which explains why Stockfish, in this case, recommends playing A1. So we will be looking at two areas. Uh, first of all, on the right, you can see the title saying, explaining the best line, and then just the list of moves for black and white. And any move that is underlined with blue uh, basically indicates that there is an explanation provided by our software. And I actually want to move to the uh, second recommended move, which is queen to a8. But just have a look for a moment at the position. 
try to understand uh, the intricacies of it. And you can also read just a basic explanation here to see why really is moving queen to a1 so important. So we see that by moving the queen to a1, we escape the black queen's threat. If the black queen uh, moves to b6, then we're in a serious problem because the queen is not protected. And in addition to that, we're achieving uh, the support of the two rooks, which are also basically not protected. And what our system allows is not just the, ex the verbal explanation, as you can see it here, but it also allows you to view the entire variation of how this black queen's threat can actually be realized by the opponent. And you can see that it's also verbalized. Um, so we understand right now that moving the queen to a1 brings about a number of advantages in the position and basically it would have turned this game from a drawish game to a winning game from white. Um, so now let's just have a look at what happens uh, right after we play queen to a1. So queen to a1 hopefully was played, then comes uh, queen to e8. And here I want to show you something really interesting. So the system recommends playing e8 because it escapes the white rook's threat. As you can see, the white rook right now, or actually just a move before, was x-raying the knight. And we can see it by those uh, blue arrows, which I'm just going to try and highlight now. You see this? If, if you click on it, it will take you to uh, the verbiage that explains that the white rook at d1 x-rays the black knight at d7. And once the, the queen is moved to um, e8, we're actually uh, neutralizing this threat. And again, we can open this explanation and see the different ways in which it might be actually happening on the board. So if we just run through this quickly, um, you are chess aficionado, so I'm sure you'll handle. Uh, queen to e8, and then if the bishop captures on d5, pawn captures, rook captures, and now the um, knight can move. It is no longer pinned um, because of the uh, escape of the queen. This um, is just an example of how I make a move now, and then later on, the decision tree, or the chess game, um, my move comes with different consequences. And we can see this through another perspective, not just uh, the, uh, the white works threat, but also the threat of captures on d5. Let's have a look at it again. So queen moved to e8, and now if we play captures on d5, and then pawn captures on d5, and then if we have bishop to d6, then the uh, knight can still move, and even had this been played, then we would in the end uh, reach this position. So these are two concrete examples of how uh, our algorithm is able to account for what one action, oh, sorry, what one action does now and how it affects uh, later courses uh, in the game. The second example I want to show you is of relating to the same human factors that chess players would be discussing them among themselves uh, when they analyze a position. Uh, one such uh, concept, which is also very known in artificial intelligence, is the concept of a counterfactual. So let's discuss a situation that uh, is either not legal or isn't possible or hasn't been actually made uh, in, in, in history, say it that way. Um, so in this case, wait, sorry, this is not the one. So we, we, we can you think of yourselves playing chess and saying, ah, oh, what could I have done had that piece not been there, okay? What, what great win I would have brought to myself had that piece not been there. So this is basically uh, an example of that. So let's just have a look. Um, this is also a master game. This is Kiara Akobian from 2015. I think it's uh, the Turkish, um, a big Turkish tournament. I think it was the Olympiad. Um, and here again, we just give the plain explanation of, of why right now the best move according to Stockfish is um, knight to b4. Um, and as you can see, uh, it threatens to play uh, check on c2. It allows uh, check on uh, after captures on f3. 
um, and it lures the white pawn to f3 and steps into a dangerous place. But I actually want you to look at something else in this case. We are also able to build um, a reasoning model or a thought process of a human person for this position. And let's read it out. So black wants to win the, win the queen. Let's have a look at that uh, sort of uh, cascade of events. So we would have wanted this to happen. Rook uh, check on d1, captures on d1, another check on d1, captures by the king, and then the move that we're currently unable to do, which is bishop captures on f3. And after that, that's when we can take the queen. So this is uh, a fantasy, uh, if you will, or a counterfactual. Um, and now what we do is we provide players with a way to remove that obstacle from the way. And this is how we do it. How do we get the black knight out of the bishop's way? I'm gonna reset the position again just so you can have another look at it. We have the bishop x-raying the uh, knight at f3, but it's being blocked by a knight. So how do we move the black knight? Playing knight to b4 before d1 solves the problem because if knight to b4 and now captures on b4, now we played the events that we saw before and this completely changes the position. So now, captures on f3 is possible and now we can capture the queen. So what you see here is an explanation that is generated within a matter of seconds per position and we are able to do this on any chess move. So this is Deco Chess in a glance and I welcome you to have a closer look at it. Um, just by signing up with a free account, we do not charge money for a free account and you're able to actually go through those decode processes for free on a daily basis. Um, and yeah, this is just, I think, another way to look at what chess is. So chess, the way our company sees it, is a way to explore human thought. It's an excellent way to explore human thought and on the way of exploring human thought, we're even able to bring a little present to the chess community, which is explaining chess with the help of Stockfish. If you have any questions. Thank you, Gideon. That was really interesting. Um, so we have time for a question from uh, Mohammed Kirkuk from Iran. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I think I visit your software last year in I think we met last year. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. But uh, my question is that your description about the output of the engine is uh, based on the known rules about the chess. But something happened with the alpha zero, for example, is we have something on known rules that I, we don't know anything about that. And uh, I think you are want to speaking about the unknown rules that alpha zero found for us. Because what you are what you are described during each uh, move that, for example, a stockfish uh, find, you describe based on the known rules. For example, Nimzovich rules or uh, Steinitz rules that just now every chess player knows about that. But what? Yeah, but let's just put it in context. These are human yes. uh, perceptions. But the thing is that Alpha Zero found some unknown rules that we just now we don't know anything about that because. We don't know these rules, and based on these new rules, we cannot evaluate the position. And alpha zero find for us, and we don't know yet these rules. Uh, it seems that we can find these new rules that alpha zero knows, and we don't know about that. Th uh, yes, thanks. Still, I, I think um, uh, this is the kind of basis of a big debate that you can have at a, at a later time. Um, okay, another question, somebody? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, uh, Gideon, uh, we've seen how uh, DeepMind is thinking of applying its technology to a whole host of other areas like protein folding and so on. Do you see um, Decoder as being, uh, decode, as being in a similar way able to provide explanations? Most already? certainly. That is um, where the company is heading to. So we have chess as, a, as I said, a very big passion of ours. Um, and we want to explain chess to people, uh, but uh, this is for us just to start. So as a company now, we're already involved in uh, processes um, and 
certain accelerators and talks with companies uh, in which we want to incorporate our innovative technology to other domains. Because as I said, um, we are a layer above a recommendation system. We're agnostic to the system. So in that sense, come a system that needs explanations, we can adapt our uh, algorithms to try and explain it. Okay, one final question. Yeah, I'm curious about y using Stockfish as the kernel here, and, and you wrap that. Have you tried wrapping Leila? Not yet. This is definitely something uh, of interest, um, and we would obviously love to do the same thing with Alpha Zero. Um, to, to try and, and put our uh, explanation system on other uh, neural networks um, is definitely both a step for us in, in our roadmap, uh, and it also, of course, requires the collaboration uh, will of the other side. But most certainly, that this is uh, something to come in the future. True. That's true. That's true. Okay, well, I think we're going to have an absolutely fascinating future, the way that uh, AI is marching and the different strands of it, the whole area of explanation. Uh, so, um, wow. Thanks for having me, John. This was a, a pleasure to show a bit of what we do. Thank you very much.